Good morning. I would like to thank Mitch Carmichael for expanding my vocabulary this morning as not once but twice he pulled out the ubiquitous word. And I thought, I've heard that, but I, I don't know. So for those who are like me, present, appearing, or found everywhere is the definition. Sounds like a spelling bee so, word. Uh, oh, yeah. I would, I would have been out early. Yeah, you, you, ubiquitous. <laughs> you were spelling bee, weren't you, uh, Mr. Gilstrap? Yes, I, I, yes, I, I was. I, too, was spelling bee when I was uh, a wee Say lad. it, spell it, say it. Yeah. Uh, I made it in the Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh spelling bee. I think I finished seventh. I finished. Mis misdemeanor threw me out, by the way. I finished first at Kings Park Elementary. In the school? Well, how about in a in greater the competition? We didn't have greater competition, oh. so it was just, it was, it was, and it was only the sixth grade. Well, I guess it, I could have competed against the second grader, but that would have been embarrassing. You would have made them lost. cry, and then you'd have been penalized <laughs> exactly. again, as you've done in the past. That's right. Uh, Attorney General and candidate for Governor Patrick Morris, who's our guest here on the program. Patrick, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, guys. Hope everything's going well. Any spelling bees in your past, Patrick? No, I was generally a pretty good speller. Uh, I don't think we uh, competed on the uh, national stage or the state stage, but I generally was a pretty good speller. But uh, that was a long time ago. So, <laughs> are you know. are you feeling pretty brave this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'm ready for that. Are you ready? I'm much more ready for I'm much more ready for a debate on on any topic. But. You don't want to have to spell ubiquitous this morning, huh? <laughs> I, you know, I actually think I know ubiquitous. Uh, oh, let's hear it. I, I'll think, all right, I'll take a shot at it. So I think it's so it's U B I Q U I T O U S. Bing! Oh! <laughs> Man, you hit it out of the park! Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, ubiquitous. Yeah, now, uh, use it in a sentence, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just messing uh, with that. He, uh, John has, uh, John's skills are ubiqu ubiquitous as he can apply them in many fact patterns or circumstances. <laughs> you know, what we would do in grade school is the teacher would say, now use it in a sentence, and I would say, the teacher asked me to use the word ubiquitous in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, that didn't go over well. I was going to say, she didn't let you get away with not that. Not in right? Catholic school. That does not go over well with nuns in Catholic school. Uh, Patrick, let's talk about this Kroger settlement, because uh, this was one of the last dominoes we were all waiting to fall. This was. So a very big deal. We were able to reach a $68 million settlement with Kroger. And this really completes uh, the latest set of litigation in the opioid epidemic. As many people listening know, I've gone after the pharmaceutical supply channel where I think that there's culpability. Always has to be that we think that there's uh, evidence of wrongdoing, and we've made those allegations. And then we were able to reach an agreement on this before the trial was scheduled to go. All told now, the gross amount for all the settlements will now be uh, around $1 billion. And very importantly for those listening, these are dollars that are going to be used based upon how the legislature blessed it, how the counties and cities blessed it. It's not just how the attorney general uh, viewed how the money sh should be spent. <coughs> and it's really targeted to those who need it most. So tackling the problem from a supply, a demand, an educational perspective. And I'm really excited about it because now we're in the end game, and there's an opportunity first for the court uh, to – finalize the attorney's fees and costs. Obviously, the counties and cities have to approve of the Kroger settlement, uh, but then the regions will have their election about who will serve on the foundation board. The governor will make his picks for the foundation. Uh, as many people listening may know, the money, 72.5%, will be run by a private foundation, the West Virginia First Foundation, composing of six board members from regions around the state and five board members approved by the governor, subject to confirmation by the Senate. So this is an exciting time uh, because we have a chance to make sure these dollars are used wisely, and that's good because uh, no one wanted to send money down the black hole and let government waste it. The payments are made over time, half up front, and then the rest of it comes uh, filtering through over the course of uh, seven years, I think it is, correct? 
That's right. Eight. For Kroger, it's thirty-four million for the first year, twelve million uh, for the second year, twelve million for the third year, and then the rest is backlogged over a, a seven-year period. And I think it's important for people to understand that many of these settlements, uh, it goes over a fifteen-year period. So it's not as if all the money is available up front, but there will be the ability relatively quickly after the board uh, gets uh, seated to do needs assessments across the state. So I think that could provide some real meaningful relief to people, and I'm excited about that. And, guys, I think it's important, especially given the volume of fentanyl that's flooding into our state right now, the supply that comes in from China, goes through the Mexican drug cartels, and makes its way right into West Virginia, is slaughtering our people. And we need to make sure that there's a plan and there are resources to fight back against it. And for the first time ever in West Virginia, there is a plan with resources available. So I'm thrilled about that. You know, none of this is going to take back any of the lost life, the terrible things that happened, uh, but it can hopefully prevent lives from being lost in the future. The deal also comes with a 2.94% most favored nation protection, a guarantee that West Virginia won't be prejudiced by a future national settlement. What does that mean to people who don't understand what a 2.94% most favored nation protection is? insurance, right? So imagine that you settle an agreement and you want to make sure that if you're one of the early states to settle, that the amount doesn't get larger and larger, just like we did in the beginning. Uh, people remember folks criticized me for all the settlements when we had actually put in protections in place mm-hmm. uh, for the states, and that's very, very good. So this means that if there's a uh, settlement and, let's say, 38 or 58, 50 states are involved, that you're going to look at that settlement and you're going to compare it to the numbers we have. And if for some reason the landscape changed considerably and the settlement got a lot bigger, then West Virginia would get an even bigger share. And so that's why we did this, because that's happened in some circumstances, but this actually helps protect West Virginians' position. John? You've been involved with this case for a long, long time, and you've and you've, you've seen how it works and, and the damage that the drugs do. If if you were elected king, if you got to spend this money, uh, how would you prioritize it? You know, we're gonna, we would prioritize it the very way I think that this foundation is going to be charged with prioritizing it. And obviously having negotiated it with the counties and cities, we're very hopeful that this actually happens. I'm not in charge of the foundation, but certainly we're, we're putting in place the infrastructure to help make it work. But the goal is to do a needs assessment first. So you look around the state, say, what does this county, what does this region need? Some counties and regions are doing various things that uh, they don't need beds. They don't need transportation as much. Others, you go to a county, let's say you go to Grant County, and they talk a lot about transportation. They talk a lot about how far it is to get to beds and the facilities that they need. So. I think you need to do a needs assessment looking at uh, what the region, what the county is doing, and then based upon that, you target the dollars so that the dollars are best spent. And that's how I would spend the money, because, and it would be really targeted in three ways. You go after the supply, you go after the demand, and you go after uh, education and prevention. And so I think you would look to have a split You'd have the first couple years, there'd be an extra bolus of dollars that would be available to address some of the lack of infrastructure around the state now. Then you would smooth out the money that's available in the foundation over that 15-year period so that you're not seeing jagged expenditures from year to year. And uh, then you would have consistent measurement of those dollars so that there's accountability for how the money's being spent. And fortunately, the Attorney General's office is going to have oversight over this foundation. And so uh, I think that I would try to spend it the way that this is designed to be spent. And I did spend six months to a year negotiating this uh, with the counties and the cities. It's it's not a perfect system, but I think it's, it's pretty good. And I commend the counties and the cities for 
uh, working through all these details because I do think it's going to make a big difference for West Virginia, especially with the fentanyl plague uh, existing right now. Matt Miller. Patrick, while it, it is good, the programs and things that will be set up, I'm sure that there are going to be individuals across the Mountain State who maybe lost a loved one, and especially considering that, that maybe they even got fixed or hooked on opioids through a prescription as they were dealing with a pain issue and it, and it, it carried too far and they lost their lives. And some may look and say, this settlement is great and I appreciate the education and so forth and the, the elements that will fight it so nobody else has to go through this. But, but what about me and my family? Will there be any kind of, of, of settlement or, or money that, that goes to those families? I think that the goal behind this is really to ensure that we never see this happen again. And so uh, there are monies available for a wide variety of programs and people certainly who have been victimized uh, by the opioid epidemic may have access to some resources. But the goal behind this, when you have limited resources, is to try to apply the dollars to make sure this never happens again. And that was certainly one of my goals. But most assuredly, whether you're talking about the counties and the cities, they will have dollars. The foundation will have dollars. There are eligible purposes that would allow people who would come in and to make arguments about resources. Uh, But obviously, the needs assessment is designed to look at the problem from a going forward perspective, because I think a lot of people want to make sure that you honor the memory of those who passed by ensuring that there won't be another generation lost to senseless death. And that you do that in part by focusing on how we can assure this doesn't happen ever again in the future. Tell us a little more about the West Virginia First Foundation. Has that foundation already been established? And, and is this an, a foundation that you would see being kind of here for good? Now it will stay. So the foundation is about to be established. I think that it had been out for one final review by the legal representatives of the counties and the cities. And so we're just waiting for uh, their approval and blessing. And then we can get it filed. And then we're waiting for really a few things to happen. One, the court needs to rule on the attorney's fees and costs because that needs to be taken off the top before the, everything is calculated, what money goes to the counties and cities. So that has to happen before any money uh, flows. And then separately, uh, the governor needs to make appointments to the board, uh, the five appointees uh, subject to confirmation of the Senate. And then the regions need to get together and they need to nominate people from each region. After all that happens, uh, then the board will be allowed to be sat and then They will open up the process. They'll have the needs assessment. They'll begin uh, making decisions. So that's the timeline. And so the money only begins to flow after all those things occur uh, because you can't start by sending checks out for only one part of the process. You have to do everything at the same time. So uh, we're obviously working to help encourage all the parties to move uh, forward as fast as possible. I know on my end, The one big remaining item, excuse me, is to hire an executive director, uh, which also needs to have uh, approval of the board. And that is something where we put out for an RFP for a professional firm to help us find someone who's very, very qualified uh, to run this private foundation because there will be a lot of money in it. And uh, I'm in that process now. We went through the formal bid process. And, in fact, this morning I will be going through and I'll be reading the bids that just came in uh, in terms of the firms. And then we'll uh, make a decision on which firm to hire, and they'll go out and begin looking uh, for a team for that foundation. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, our guest here on the program, you recently joined forces with Attorneys General from a Tennessee-led comment letter with Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and Virginia. Patrick, and it's all about washing machines in people's homes. Can you make some common sense out of this one? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, unfortunately, in this time of inflation ravaging West Virginia and our country, you have uh, the alphabet soup agencies in the federal government, the EPA, the DOE, and others uh, issuing one rulemaking after another uh, that's going to make it harder for West Virginia families to afford basic necessities. And one of the ones that came out relates to washing machines. And uh, we saw that the DOE was coming out and they were trying to put in place new proposed standards. And this would be a very expensive change. And we uh, also believe that these standards are likely to cause washing machines to not work as well. And we had prior experience with some of the changes in standards with dishwashers, and we know that this is going to be very costly uh, to those who are manufacturing uh, the washing machines. So especially during a time when we're seeing such terrible inflation, and it really hits West Virginia badly, people need more money in their, uh, in their pockets. We need to enhance the standard of living. This is not the time to be driving out all these new standards that are going to really make it unaffordable to buy washing machines or hurt people most in need. So that's why we weighed in, because we're very worried about the timing of this. Is it? No, go ahead, John. I just got, Along the same lines, not intending to change the subject, but along the same lines of alphabet soup, on June 1st, when the day dawns, we're going to have thousands of new felons in the states because of the ATF rule on pistol braces. Are we doing something to get in, in front of that ruling? We, we are. In fact, West Virginia and my office uh, filed a lawsuit, 25 states, and we are right now in court and we're waiting for a decision. We've asked for a preliminary injunction on that because I don't think that millions of Americans should become felons in the next few weeks uh, because the feds have a warped view of what's going to make our state and country more safe. So uh, we have filed that lawsuit. We have asked for the injunction. We're leading that uh, for the states. And I'm hopeful we hear something back in the upcoming weeks. Medicare scams. Now what's the latest with that? Well, as many people know, uh, we've been talking about scams uh, for as long as I've been on this program, and many people know that scams have been going on really since the beginning of time. So what we try to do is we warn people uh, so that they can protect themselves from what's going on. And, you know, we constantly hear in our office about people posing as a Medicare representative and asking for personal identifiable information, whether it's bank account, credit card information, maybe your Social Security card. And when they do that, they're trying to get access to your personal information so that they can target you and ultimately steal from you. And we usually, different times a year, we see an uptick in the scam. So we want to warn people, whatever you do, do not provide your personal identifiable information to these people because it is a scam. And you want to make sure that if there's something to do with Medicare, you can always call uh, their office, their number, you do not have to give any information away. In fact, I just think it's a good idea. Don't give any financial information away on these unsolicited calls. Is it possible to bust these people who are committing these scams, Patrick, or are many of these folks overseas? You know, we have had a couple circumstances where we've been able to work with the FBI and other sister states where we go after some of the scams. And so throughout my tenure, there have been a few like that. But I will tell you, they do operate in the shadows uh, across the country, across the world. And so it, it does make it very hard. You know, I know that there, to give you an example, we uh, once were able to work with the San Diego Police Department on uh, following up on a complaint made that a woman was victimized by the grandparents scam. And she had sent gift cards to a grandson and unfortunately, it wasn't the grandson. It was a scammer, and the scammer ended up operating out of San Diego, and uh, we were able to obtain access to the videotape showing the person used the cards. Uh, but unfortunately, in that circumstance, 
uh, the San Diego police, I believe, you know, didn't really pursue it very aggressively because it wasn't as high on their list. And that's a shame. But what I would say is that we do uh, pursue these. We try to get them in the hands of uh, other states, other of the FBI. And there is enforcement. And if we do catch you and if the FBI catches you, um, in most circumstances, they're going to throw a a pretty stiff penalty against you. Uh, but it is hard when they're operating in the shadows overseas, no doubt. Matt Miller. Maybe we just scam the scammer, right? You should have a department within your jurisdiction that returns those calls and scams them back. I'm just, just thinking outside the box. Just... Well, I'm very fortunate right, to, I'm, to, to have I'll a... put that on my list of ideas, <laughs> my friend. And... I have a benefactor in my life who's a Nigerian prince, <laughs> and, uh. and, and he's going to send me a lot of money. All I have to do is pay for it. That was one of the very early yeah. Internet mm -hmm. scams, wasn't it? The Nigerian prince scam. Which is the yeah. thing. Some of these sound so absurd, and yet, as you're testifying right now, so many people end up in some way being duped by this. How much money typically are, are we talking about is being scammed on, on a regular basis? Look, across the country, billions of dollars wow. get scammed every year uh, due to people that are trying to dupe uh, citizens. So it's terrible. And, in fact, uh, senior citizens really are victimized quite a bit uh, because individuals over the age of 60 do get disproportionately targeted. So that's why we have a, an elder abuse unit where we try to go after this. And, in fact, we do have some additional tools that we didn't have a few years ago. One of the things we do for seniors is we not only have the consumer protection tool, but we have the Medicaid uh, system where we're able to go after uh, abuse and neglect. So if you financially abuse someone and you're in a position of trust helping them on Medicaid, there are opportunities for us to go after you. So I don't want anyone to think, I mean, we're going to go after the criminals very, very hard. And in fact, uh, we've had more referrals over the last few years since we took over the Medicaid fraud control unit. So, you know, if, if people know of someone who's being abused or they're being targeted for scams or they've been ripped off, please let our office know uh, because we will leave no rock unturned going after these people preying on our citizens. Yeah, and Patrick, I'm wondering if, if some of the numbers might even be an underestimate, because I could only imagine if I'm, you know, 70 years of age and I've got this life experience and I realize that I've been scammed, I may be embarrassed to make that phone call and go, hey, I, I think I just got taken. So I'm sure there are, are many dollars out there that you may never know about. Well, there certainly may be things that we don't know about. Uh, but we would urge people to report it in to us, and people should not be ashamed. I know that every one of us in life have probably fallen prey to some scam or some trickery uh, by a person. I mean, I can tell you one of the more popular scams that nabbed a lot of people, really smart folks, is uh, I know when I first took office, there were a lot of scams <clears throat> relating to the Internet where people would say, is your Internet slow? Are you having problems accessing your, your account? If you are, we have a quick fix for you. Just call this number, and we'll have someone immediately come in, into, enter your computer, clean up the slowness, and then you're going to have a much better experience. And when people hear that, especially in an area where they may have slow Internet, right, where the speed is low, that sounds pretty attractive, and people are desperate to get to high-speed internet so people fell prey to that but it's not such a reasonable thing or oh your uh your mcafee a virus scam has expired make sure you re-up it and make sure you pay a hundred bucks and you give your credit card and it's some person operating overseas and you didn't know it until after the hundred bucks went through but you most certainly had wanted to protect your computer from scams or from viruses that slow your computer down so we we have seen things like that and some of them could affect anyone not just seniors because they, they're so believable and pat doesn't the use of a credit card provide some level of protection in the sense that you can cancel the the, the payment if if it's not legitimate i mean it, it it certainly does provide some level of protection because you may be in a position to get some of your money back 
but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it still doesn't block the fraud, and, mm-hmm. and there could be cost. I mean, obviously, credit card companies can try to go after the person and get their resources back, and sometimes they certainly do. But if a transaction occurs quickly, there still may be fraud in the system. So, and then and when that happens, of course, the price of goods and services for everyone goes up. So that's not good. But, uh, you know, we, we, of course, would just urge people, take the precautions. Do not respond to these unsolicited requests. Make sure you know who you're dealing with so you don't get ripped off. I know you have to roll on out, Patrick, but it's important to remind people you do not have criminal jurisdiction out of your office. Do you have to then go through county prosecutors where the citizen might reside who's been scammed? Yeah, so... That's exactly right, and we have done some referrals for some of these scammers, and, and some of the local prosecutors have, have taken that up. So we do have very limited criminal uh, jurisdiction in terms of Medicaid fraud, a couple other narrow areas, but most certainly not for these scams or these contractors. We do have to go to uh, local prosecutors. There was a situation a few years ago uh, where we went to the sheriff and we went through uh, Jefferson County, and there were contractors that were scamming people who were prosecutors and we also have uh, referrals we made uh, down in southern west virginia there's one that's still in uh in trial right now or in, in court where those people were prosecuted in multiple counties so we do referrals and those referrals can sometimes lead to criminal prosecutions and that's good because if we have evidence of a crime if we can't do anything about it we're going to refer it to someone who can Thank you for your time today, Patrick. Hey, thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, also a candidate for governor, leading in the polls, too, by the way.